Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our podcast. With us once again in a return engagement is Mr. Brent Johnson. As you recall, Brent is the host of the internationally renowned Global Freedom Report, as well as the long-running freedom talk show, The Voice of Freedom. He has a superb website. You can find it at freedomradio.us. You can also listen to The Voice of Freedom on his regular podcasts. You can also feel free to call him toll-free at 888-385-3733. Again, that's 888-385-3733. Brent, once again, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, John, it's a pleasure to be back with you. I've enjoyed our last get-together, and I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it today as well. Yes, very much, likewise. So, Brent, um, one of your many specialties, is, as we touched on your intro, and just in general for people who know you are, is and are the subject of trusts, um, specifically common law trusts. Uh, we queried some of the comments from our audience from the last show that we did that was, as you know, pretty information intensive. And it left some people with a bit of confusion and then a little bit of less clarity than, than I think they were hoping. So to help them, because this, this subject is so robust and so broad reaching, I'd just like you to kind of reiterate and talk a little bit about why common law trusts and the benefit of having an LLC attached to that. Why do those two things work together so well? Okay, well, first off, okay, a common law trust is all about protecting your property rights. Okay, now a common law trust is a trust based on fundamental law that precedes any government. So no government has control over or regulates common law trust activity. So that's the the primary benefits of a common law trust are privacy, number one, because nobody, absolutely nobody knows you've set up a trust unless you tell them. You can't look it up in the statutory you know, uh, realm. It's not there. It's a private contract. So privacy is the most operative word when it comes to these trusts. And I consider privacy to be a commodity. I've been saying that for years, that without privacy, you don't have liberty and liberty is the ultimate objective. So setting up a common law trust gives you privacy. And if you do it properly, you pretty much eliminate your personal liability by having the trust's own property that you benefit from. Now, you mentioned an LLC, okay? The one thing that a common law trust cannot do is set up banking. The reason is that a common law trust, being common law, doesn't have an EIN. Now, there are some people out there who will sell common law trusts and then get EINs and they will tell you, oh, it doesn't matter. I will tell you it does matter. An EIN, which is a form of a taxpayer identification, is the property of the corporate government. It belongs to the government. So when you have an EIN assigned to a common law trust, you basically have government property attached to the trust. The government gets to regulate its own property and control it. Therefore, by association, the common law characteristics of the trust no longer prevail, and it is treated as a statutory trust, even though the indenture says it is a common law trust. Hmm. So for that reason, a properly administered common law trust does not have an EIN and therefore cannot get banking. So what do you do? If you have some property that generates revenue, let's say a business or maybe a, a a house that you rent out to people, something that generates revenue, where do you put the money? If the trust can't set up the banking, what do you do? So we've come up with what we think is a good solution. Keeping in mind privacy is you know, my number one issue. Mm -hmm. um, and that is to set up something, we call it a stealth LLC. That's just our term for it. It's a limited liability company out of South Dakota. South Dakota has the best privacy protections of all states with respect to LLCs. The, the name of the member, the owner, the manager is not in the public record in South Dakota. And the EIN that comes with the LLC is not connected to your social security number. For these reasons, similar to the trust, nobody knows 
that you have involvement with this LLC unless you tell them. Okay, you can go to the South Dakota Secretary of State's uh, Corporate Division's website and look up your South Dakota LLC and you won't find your name anywhere there. So what we do is we recommend in terms of a trust owning property that generates revenue. What we do with it is this, the trust, you set up the trust, you set up the LLC. You are the manager, the member, the owner of the LLC. The trust issues a contract hiring the LLC as a financial management agent. So the LLC then sets up a bank account. The account information is listed in the trust's banking resolution where trust funds are held. So now you've got a bank account in the name of the LLC that holds the money that comes in from the business that is owned by the common law trust. So for example, you send out invoices. They say, make your payments to such and such LLC. Payments come in, or maybe they come in from online payment plans or however you do it. Payments come in, they end up in the LLC account where they are held and administered on behalf of the trust. Uh, so let us say, for example, you are the general manager of the trust. You're hired to run the day-to-day -day operations of that business owned by the trust. Right. You do the hiring, you do the firing, you do everything, okay? Um, you are also the manager of the LLC. So what we do is we actually provide you as general manager of the trust an invoice which represents an instruction from the trust, which is the principal, to the LLC, which is the agent. By the way, the LLC is an agent, therefore it carries no liability for its activities. The law of agent and principal. So we provide you this invoice, okay? It's got the name and address of the trust, name and address of the LLC. So let's say as your contract for running the business is you get $1,000 a week by contract. So you have this invoice, okay? You change the invoice number, change the invoice date. Under description, you put for professional services rendered December 1st through 7th, 2023, $1,000 make payable to John Dowling, okay? You then, in the capacity of general manager of the trust, you do that. Then you hand that over to John Dowling in capacity of manager of the LLC, John Dowling takes that, puts the LLC seal on it, puts it away in the LLC book and cuts himself a check for $1,000. So same thing with any expenses associated with the business or anybody else who works for the business. They all get paid out of the LLC account and the revenues go into the LLC account. Now, the thing about this LLC is it is a single member LLC. That's important. If an LLC has more than one member, it's treated like a partnership and it's corporate and there's all kinds of stuff. K1, 640, uh, 1065s, 1041s, all kinds of stuff you have to do. But a single member LLC is considered to be a disregarded entity. That is the government's term for it, not mine. There are federal forms that will say what type of entity is it. And one of the boxes is disregarded entity. That's what this LLC is. So the LLC does not have reporting requirements. The LLC does not have to jump through bureaucratic hoops like a multi-member LLC would. So the reason for setting up the LLC is to allow the business held in trust to do what it does without compromising the trust's common law character, which would happen if the trust itself got an EIN. That's a summary of why we use the LLC with trust. And not every trust needs that, but if the trust holds property that generates revenue, it's a very good solution. Very good, thanks Frank for that. Um, just inside of that question, which you articulated nicely, let's say people who are watching here today, you know, some of our audience, they have a house, they have you know, different assets, gold, silver, currency, bonds, uh, maybe a rental property, like you said, somewhere, maybe they have you have a property on the other side of the country or the other side of the world, whatever the case may be. Um, this trust that you're talking about, is that 
Is there a function in that trust where you would say you would break up those assets into different subcategories or does it all fall into one entity? Well, this is not about the trust. This is about the principle of ownership and liability. It's a universal principle. It applies everywhere in the world. The owner of property is always liable for damage caused by that property. Whether you're the owner, a corporation is, a trust is, it makes no difference. So the idea is that you personally, in order to pursue the objective of minimizing or eliminating your liability, you don't want to own anything. That's like me. I own nothing. So I have no liability. Okay. There, there's there's uh, you know, a lot to be said for having no liability. Um, that's what the trust accomplishes. Now, the thing is, if you put everything you have into one trust, you don't have the liability for it, but then the trust has all the liability. For example, I would never put a car and a house in the same thing. A house has very high value. A car has extremely high risk of liability. So car gets into an accident, house ends up getting attached. So what you do is you don't put everything together in one basket. Now, what I would generally do is I would discuss it with somebody, you know, and they say, I've got a house, um, I've got uh, 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 several vehicles, I've got a business, you know, uh, maybe I've got, uh, you know, a bunch of equipment that I use on, you know, with the business and such. So I would come back and say, okay, you put your house in one trust, you put your vehicles together in one trust, you set up a trust for your business, but you set up a trust for your equipment that the business uses, a separate trust. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it this way. I had a client who was a dentist. He set up two trusts. One was for the dental practice. One was for all that half a million dollars in equipment that the practice uses, the diamond drills, which are real diamonds, uh, the x-ray machines, all of that stuff. So the second trust had the equipment. And what the second trust did with the equipment was it leased it to the trust that had the dental practice. Now, if somebody gets a problem gets into a, a grievance against the dental practice they could go after the practice but they couldn't go after the equipment because the liability of the practice is minimized to the practice itself it doesn't take into account the equipment so they can't go for the equipment i had another client who was a farmer he set up four trusts one for the business of farming one for the real estate the house the barns all that stuff, one for the heavy equipment, the tractors, the backhoes and such, and one for the livestock. Then the three trusts that had respectively the real property, the livestock and the equipment leased it over to the trust that had the business of the farm. Now, if somebody has an, a, a complaint against the business of the farm, they can't go after the real property, they can't go after the livestock, they can't go after the equipment because the business doesn't own it right so yeah diversifying liability is really where it's at now there, there are limits for example you could put your house and the contents of your house in the same trust well every single chair you own is potential for liability somebody falls every single knife and fork you own potentially can create liability but you're not going to sit there and set up a trust for every single one of those things it gets ridiculous Right. So there's a way you balance it. What I generally do is I look at the value of the asset in question plus the risk of liability of that asset and then measure that against the cost of an additional trust. And, you know, if it's worth it, you do it. If it's not worth it, you don't do it. But you, you general rule, you don't put everything in one basket. It's just not smart. Sure, sure. No, I appreciate that. That's why I wanted you to articulate that. It's like you said in the last uh, show we did, ownership equals liability. So I think mm -hmm. that's a good rule of thumb. Last question on this subject, Brent, because I know you're pressed for time today. Um, what's the difference between a, or no, I'm sorry, um, let me rephrase it. As a trustee, can you be related to the beneficiaries of the trust? Okay. The reason a common law trust is so good at protecting your interests and your assets is because you who start off owning the property that you've put into trust 
give up legal control of the property. Now, if there is ever an attack on the trust, the way the attack will be brought always is never an exception to this because it's the only way to attack a common law trust is to try and show that you who originally owned the property still have legal control of the property. Now, legal control is defined as the ability to buy, sell, or hypothecate property. Hypothecate means borrow against. So, okay, if you set up the trust and let's say your spouse is the trustee, you are considered to have legal control. So for that reason, the principles in a trust, which is the trustee, we call it the fiduciary owner, and the protector, cannot be related to the exchanger. The exchanger is the common law equivalent of the grantor. Okay. Mm. They cannot be related. And that means not your spouse, not your children, not your parents, not your in-laws, not your cousins, right. none of that. Um, that's the reason for it. Now, in a statutory trust, that's not required. You can set up a trust. You could be the grantor. You could be the trustee. You could be the beneficiary. You know, I mean, depending upon how you set it up. But when it comes to a common law trust, there must be a separation. Ordinarily, the exchanger, the statutory grantor, the exchanger becomes the first holder of beneficial interest. We don't say beneficiary. Beneficiary is exclusive to statutory jurisdiction. It is not used in non-statutory entities. But we call it the holder of beneficial interest. And... That party is the, initially at least, is the exchanger. Um, so no, the trustee, the fiduciary owner cannot be related to that party because of the legal control issue. However, if you do it properly, you will find that the stranger, you know, the one who's not re related to you, doesn't have the authority to go out and mess with the property for his own use. I mean, that's very clear in the trust contract. And depending what type of property you put in, there are other things you can do to ensure nobody messes with the trust property. But no, you cannot have a relative do that. Very good. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate uh, the, the articulation there. Let's shift a little bit to the uh, financial markets, uh, specifically with uh, the currencies we talked about last time. Um, I want to get a little bit more of a broad reach on this show in terms of uh, just very succinctly, like, what do you see that's going on in Iraq today currently that gives you a lot of uh, encouragement about what's coming? Also, Vietnam and Zimbabwe as well. Your your thoughts on that? Well, the Iraqi dinar is considered by many to be the linchpin of the revaluation that is coming. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that it kind of is the start, if you will. Now, I'm not saying that's the case. OK, the truth is nobody knows for certain what the actual protocols will be and nobody knows for certain exactly how it will come about. But Iraq, see, one thing about all governments is that all governments, the thing they fear the most is embarrassment. That's the one thing a government can't stand. You'll notice that when a government does something wrong, they never admit it. Mm. They may come to some arrangement with the begrieved, the aggrieved party, but they'll never admit complicity in it. Never, right. you know, right. because that would make them look bad and governments never want to look bad. Now, there's a psychology to understanding what's going on. Iraq came out. OK, and I believe it was the prime minister. It might have been the, the finance minister. I, I don't remember exactly who did it. But Iraq came out officially and went on television in public and said, by the 1st of January, the U.S. dollar will no longer be valid in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for that to happen, the new dinar must have established its international rate. Right. It has to. Right. OK, otherwise, Iraq would become nothing it wouldn't be able to function at all it would like not lebanon. be able hmm? like lebanon yeah i mean like any country in that situation it could not conduct any activity with anybody outside of iraq 
Yeah, Iraq has <laughs> enormous resources. So that would be a tremendous waste. Okay. So nobody in nobody up in the upper echelons of the Iraqi government is going to come out and make such a statement unless it is true. Because they would look really, really bad. So because of that, there's a lot of optimism that before the end of the month, their dinar international rate, the new rate, will be official and out there completely. You'll be able to go up on Forex and look it up and all that stuff. Okay. If that is the case, it indicates that the rest of the countries looking at revaluation will follow suit very, very fast. So there's a lot of optimism about what is happening in Iraq, not because of what I want to see or what you or the others who are watching this want to see, but because of what actually has happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it, it is a cause for a great deal of optimism there. Now, I'm not sure what in particular you're referring to about what's going on in Vietnam. So I'm going to turn it back to you to clarify that. Yeah, I, I'm kind of wrapping them in for time's sake. But yeah, thank you for for um, adding that. So what I'm referring to is that China is visiting, Xi is visiting with Vietnam to kind of counter the US movement. Um, and, and some people know, some people don't know that there's two sides of the coin to China. There's the CCP that everybody knows about, but then there's the, the Republic side that is working on the good side of things. And that's the side that we believe is really working with Vietnam at this point to get Vietnam enough out of communism to break free their dong specifically in silver. So I just wondered if you might touch on that aspect briefly. Well, there there is reason to believe, as difficult as it may be to hear, there is reason to believe that G, I think that's how it's pronounced. G. G, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's G. Uh, there is reason to believe that G is actually participating with the White Hats mm -hmm. on this. Now, I reserve judgment on that, okay, because I have my own prejudices about China, and I admit it, okay. Um, so I could be very wrong about that. But uh, there is a strong indication that Xi, Vladimir Putin, you know, are all part of this organization helping to bring a whole new paradigm to the world, okay. Gisara, okay, some call it Gisara, which is the global equivalent of Nessara. Mm -hmm. um, and it's happening. It is happening indeed. So I would not presume to guess why he's in Vietnam right now, but I would be pretty certain that he will take whatever opportunities are presented to him to counter the bad influence of the U.S. around the world. And right now, the U.S. has a lot of bad influence around the world. Um, a, a lot of the things going on in the U.S. I mean, you know, I, I refer to Joe Biden when I edit stories for posting on my website as the fascist pretender. By the way, just so you know, fascism is a system of government. That's all it is. It's a system of government in which the government joins with the business community to set policy. That's what fascism is. Now, having defined it, could you honestly tell me that the United States is not a fascist organization? Think about it. Just think about it. You know, and okay. and that's and and when Mussolini came out and said that, you know, Italy is true fascism. That's what he was talking about. Okay. Most people just think Adolf Hitler. That's what they think. Okay. But no. Okay. Fascism and communism, Marxism as a form of communism, those two are two separate sides of an evil triangle. Okay. You know, neither one is desirable. You know, and the only thing that really is desirable is individual rights, okay? But most people don't look toward that because they want to be taken care of. They want to have somebody to blame when things don't go right. Um, you know, so that that's that's kind of why we've ended up where we are. But the U.S. is very, very much, I even refer to it as the fascist 
police states of America these days. And I'd be happy to debate that with anybody who wants to say I'm wrong. I mean, you know, I, 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 I don't say it to be mean or anything, you know, because I love my country, but I love it for what it was created to be, not what it has been turned into. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. And then on the, the other end, because <clears throat> people always say that we don't talk enough about this, I, I would beg to differ. I think we've covered it, but we'll cover it from your perspective, which is Zimbabwe. Um, couple of things, there's this contentious, and we don't get into dates and rates here or anything. I'm just making a point that in the community, there's this contentious debate about what the Zim will be worth. And, you know, you hear different people chiming in on their opinions about it. that's fine. But I'm more interested in kind of touching base with you specifically about just how much gold, uh, how replete they are with gold in there. Something in their happened. Um, still oh, here. my. Still here. You have frozen up. I'm still here. There you go. Okay, you froze up. I was watch. Yeah. I, I was sitting there in my mind going, you uh -huh. don't have dead air. It says they, uh, the, my internet connection is unstable. Well, That's what happened. Yeah, yesterday it was rumble going down. Now they're doing it here. So who knows? But um, no, but uh, we're talking about the Zim and how really replete they are with gold reserves. And, I, and some people know that some people may not be up to speed on that. But what I wanted to focus with you is on just how valuable that country is from an uh, people in an asset perspective, but also, you know, watching Nelson Chamisa is a fascinating process because just like President Trump here had the election stolen from him to some degree on purpose, it was on purpose, he allowed it to happen for people to wake up. Uh, Chamisa is going through much the same thing where he's going to be restored uh, to his rightful place as president there. And he's vowed to restore all of their finances and gold. So I wondered if you might just briefly touch on that. Well, for people. Zimbabwe has tremendous resources, tremendous resources. And um, the new financial system is going to revalue all currencies out there based on the natural resources of each country. Mm -hmm. So we're going to throw out the current formula for establishing any kind of rate. Just toss it out and it's all going to be redone. Now, in terms of the ZIM, the ZIM, as it is called, is a bond. Mm -hmm. Bonds are essentially investments in the future of a given country, the issuer of the bonds. That's what it is. On their face, bonds are actually worthless. They are not worth anything. They, Unlike currency, currency can be exchanged. You go to a currency exchange, you say, I have a dollar. I want to exchange it for euros. They check the rate. They give you the appropriate rate in euros. They exchange one currency for another. Right. Anybody can do that. Sure. But bonds are not negotiable. Okay. You can't just say, I have a bond. Okay. And I want to get what I can get for it. You can't do that. Bonds become valuable because the issuing body, which is generally a country, determines that they are going to be valuable. For example, you go get yourself a U.S. savings bond. It will tell you on the bond, this, this bond matures in 100 years or something like that. So you got a $1,000 bond. Okay. It will be worth $1,000, that means, in 100 years. Okay. That's what it means. And so what you're doing is you are investing in the United States on the presumption that a hundred years from now, you're going to have that thousand dollars and it will be worth that amount. That's what a bond actually is. So the Zimbabwe bonds that come out with a hundred and trillion dollars and such, they're not going to be worth a hundred trillion dollars. That's just not going to happen. What will they be worth? I won't even get into it. Okay. Because I don't discuss rates. I right. simply don't do that. Right. But uh, because of the substantial natural resources of Zimbabwe, it is reasonable to conclude that Zimbabwe will value those bonds. They will be valued by the country. Remember, the bonds on their face have no value until the issuing body comes out and says, we are valuing this. Right. And it's very reasonable to presume that Zimbabwe is going to give some substantial value to these bonds because they have a lot to gain by that, you know, economically. They have a tremendous amount to gain and they have the opportunity to do so. So 
Absolutely. everybody should feel very comfortable and confident about the Zimbabwe bonds. Now, the one thing I have heard from the very beginning, from decades ago, is that the only bonds that will be given substantial value at all will be the 2008 and 2009 series okay. AA and AB, meaning the, seri the serial number begins with either AA or AB. Right. So that's what you're looking for, okay, if you're looking for that. And you can still get Zimbabwe bonds, from what I understand. You can. That's great. Thank you, Brent, for that information. Right. I appreciate that detail. Thank you, Brent. I'm sure the audience does as well. Uh, incidentally, for those who are looking to get currencies, we're not financial advisors. This is not financial advice. We're just giving you our feedback based on what we've seen in our experience in this. There's many great choices out there, and you have to do your diligence and make your choice, uh, your due diligence to make your, your proper choice accordingly. We're just giving you one of many good options. So if you're looking to better your position or get in the game of currencies or bonds, as Brent talked about, we'll leave that link in the description for you. Brent, any last thoughts uh, you have for the uh, audience today? And uh, where can, once again, how can people find about your work? Well, my last thoughts are always my first thoughts, which is that you were born as a sovereign. You were born as the king or the queen of your life. You are the ruler. You are not a subject, okay? You do not need to obey what you are told to do. You can choose to, but you do not need to. And what I invite you all to remember is that you are endowed by your creator. How many of you were created by government? Then you didn't get your rights from the government. The government can never take them away, but they can violate your rights. So the question is this, if you know you are royalty, and your public servants come and violate your rights, what are you going to do about it? You can get in touch with me by calling me toll-free at 888-385-FREE or 888-385-3733, or you can just go to our website at www.freedomradio.us, freedomradio.us. One last thing, this Saturday, now I don't know when this is going to go up, so it may be too late. If so, edit this out. But this Saturday, December 16th, I am conducting a common law trust webinar. Okay, if you contact us, you can get information about it. You can still sign up for it. I will be doing a second one the first week in January at the end of the week. Okay, I think it's January 6th. So if you're interested, it's a two and a half to three hour presentation on common law trust. There'll be space for Q&A and stuff like that as well. If you're interested, call us 888-385-FREE or go to the website freedomradio.us. Well, thanks so much, Brent. Once again, thank you for being here with us on our podcast. And we pray that you have a very safe and happy holiday season. And the same to all of you. God bless.